Can y'all hear me okay? <laughs> oh, look, the exit door. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been asked by uh, some of our friends, if y'all could check your phones and turn them to that little setting where they don't make any noise, that would be helpful. Um, thank you. We've got a lot today. Um, I'm, we'll see if I get through all of it. I've got a timer at the back. Um, I might say things that some of you don't agree with. And I'm just going to say that up front. I'm not a, you know, when I was at Texas Tech, uh, I, was, I was there at the year where the university started requiring the professors to put uh, trigger warnings in their syllabi. So if you needed certain assistance with your feelings, you know, you knew where to go on the university campus. Yeah. This is not that, okay? <laughs> um, in my opinion, as professionals, it's okay to disagree. We don't all do the same thing. Uh, there, I know there's a mentality out there that everybody with a life insurance license all does the same thing. And anybody who can find the letters I, B, and C on the keyboard next to each other all does the same thing. And I don't subscribe to that. Uh, that's okay. It doesn't bother me. I've been guilty in the past of getting caught up in getting upset about what so-and-so is doing or such-and-such -such kind of marketing tactic. I'm to the point I don't care. Because when, when, a, when a client who really is pursuing the truth wants to know how this works and wants to do what Nelson taught and then comes to me, I just talk about that. Right, And if you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. That mentality informs my entire process with people. So if everyone wants to get caught up in the click funnels and the online marketing and the next most clever marketing scheme and the, all the social media advertising, I'm like, have at it. You want to buy clicks on TikTok and YouTube? Be my guest. I'll take 500 legitimate, high-quality individuals watching and paying attention over 50,000 any day. I don't need a lot of people. I need the right people. I'm a quality over quantity kind of person. Look at me already getting off into the wilderness. I told you this would be a lot. I do have, I, you know, so I'm going to go into my background in a bit, but this is a economics-focused kind of presentation. There are, and look, let's just acknowledge it. I get that some people are like, oh yeah, the economic stuff, I don't need that. Just tell me how to sell life insurance. Just tell me how IBC pertains to the individual. Let's make it easy, right? All this economic stuff. And look, the economists are totally guilty of making it way too complicated, of screwing up a lot of the basic definitions like money and capital. Right, so we've all got some fault in the game. But for me, I find that a coherent, direct, deliberate economic approach helps clarify things. At the end of the day, this, this is financial stuff. I mean, we're going to talk about economics. Or we're not, which, okay, then don't. But then you're going to end up like many of the people who have come to me after they've gone through the ringer with some other agent or been put through some sales process or have ended up with IUL or VUL or some little tiny 1090 manipulated annually renewing term, you know, can't, can pay the premium for three years maybe, you know, that, a lack of focus on the technical aspects has consequences. And I'm a little over, I'm a little over the idea that, oh, we don't need to make it all too smart or too, you know, that, that's over my head. Okay. Okay. But you know, there's also something to be said, but intelligent lay people can understand this. This is not rocket science. You know, and the economists on CNBC or the, uh, the financial entertainment crowd, Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, they can make it sound all complicated. And you throw some tax qualified plan language in there, you'll confuse the daylights out of someone real quick. It doesn't have to be that way, right? So there's going to be some economics in this. And I think it's helpful. Hopefully it's helpful. I'm glad David did the demographic thing earlier. Uh, 
I hope this really resonates with the quarter or you, quarter of you or so who are brand new, uh, who are, or those who are going through the student part of the program. For those who are current practitioners, hopefully this language gives form to some of the thoughts that you already have, right? To take economic terminology, apply it to IBC, and in so doing, ground what Nelson taught in the science of human action. That's a, that's what, that's how I come at this is a, is a desire to take what Nelson taught, which I think is like my, the, my PhD focuses on capital theory. Like in the little 92 page book, the word capital is mentioned 73 times. It's a work in applied capital theory and it's got links. It's got threads back 150 years in the history of economic thought. And it's, it, it, to my mind, knowing something about that, puts you on very solid ground. We're going to talk some about business cycles here at the end. Knowing something about the business cycle, knowing something about what's called the Austrian business cycle theory, sets you apart from conventional advisors. They don't have an answer for the business cycle. It's called sequence of returns risk. How do you know? I'm not going to get ahead of myself. All right. For those of you who don't, some of y'all know me, but some don't. Uh, so I have a bachelor's and a master's in, in ordinary economics. Uh, I'm pursuing a PhD in Austrian economics. Uh, Bob Murphy's actually my PhD advisor on that. Uh, I met Nelson in May of 2016. Got, uh, was paired with James uh, Nethery, who's my, uh, my ongoing mentor. Quick, super quick comment on mentorship. This idea that you're going to be someone's mentee for three to five cases and then go off and have a great career, I think, is a joke. Um, You know, that, that there are so many recruiting and training myths in this business. It's like the wild, wild west. Uh, and I'm so glad that God said, hey, we're just going to put you on the right track. Uh, I still, we, we, we were talking about a case last week, you know, uh, we've been do, since 2017. So it'll be six years later this year. And I'm still learning. I mean, the, the arrival syndrome is not just something that a client gets to overcome when learning IBC. It's something that an agent gets to overcome when learning how to be a mentee. So the whole splitting case things, and there's a lot of stuff that, that I've come to discover goes on in the contracting of agents. I mean, like, again, I, economist background, I am not a financial salesperson. People ask me what I do, I kind of shudder. It's like, don't go online. I mean, let's not, cause I'm going to say life insurance agent and they have preconceptions and it's like this, there's a lot of things that I don't like in agent training and mentorship that goes on with the contracting. I mean, if you don't know what your commission rank is, I don't like talking about commission. If you don't know what your commission rank is and what the nature of the split is, there's a problem. And there's too much of that out there for my, in my opinion. The name I go by in terms of my business is Greg's Capital Strategies, where clients become capitalists. Man, this is about becoming a capitalist. And we're going to talk about the relationship between capital and opportunity and how that affects how you might encourage people to use or not use policy loans. I, I go by the attraction approach. Uh, this terminology comes first from James, then from Jim Rohn. Uh, it's in a book that I am part of a group that we study, <laughs> uh, attraction rather than promotion. Uh, show up, tell people who you are and what you do. Let, you know, let the truth attract. I don't cold call. There's not a marketing budget. I don't pay for social media ads. Um, you, you, maybe you look at the podcast. I'm a so co-host of the Banking with Life podcast with James. You know, maybe you look at that thing. Go, there's a grand design or a budget. I mean, we are just, we are showing up and telling people who we are, what we do and why we think what Nelson taught is right. And that attracts a certain kind of people, and it repels others, thank God. Um, and I'm okay with that. I, I keep a blog. I think there's probably more words on the IBC written on this blog than there is anywhere else online. I could be wrong. It's a lot. Topic number one here is time preference. We're going to build from the question of policy design. I understand, and it's been said... IBC is not about policy design, and, and, and I agree. 
It's also a problem when someone who goes online and starts swimming in the noise encounters the illustrations, the 1090, the 595, the big high year dump in, you know, I'm going to show greater efficiency by year two than anybody else. Uh, someone who's swimming in all of that to then want to do what Nelson taught and not know how they contrast, right? Because they've, they've heard, they've got structure in their mind about policy structure, about design, and they're being told it's not about design. And it's not, okay, but how do we bridge that? Like, I think we do have to talk some, I don't want to, but I think we do have to talk some about policy design. I think there's a legitimate case to be made from Nelson Nash's IBC perspective for a substantial base policy with a long-term oriented premium payment duration, I call it, that can accomplish superior results for the client, meaning more cash value, more capital, more death benefit over that individual's lifetime. It's better for them. It's better for them from a particular philosophy, as we'll get into here in a moment. Nelson said, think long range. This is part of the philosophy. In economics, we refer to this idea of time preference. Time preference is just like a ratio. If you just a numerator, numerator and denominator, we distinguish between high time preference and low time preference. If you got a large denominator, if you place great emphasis on the satisfaction of preferences sooner, as opposed to satisfaction of the same uh, preference later, then you have high time preference, right? A large numerator, small denominator, big number, that's high time preference. Okay, these are all the socialist countries, the ones who are who constantly consume their own capital, can't save, right? Used to be in this country, we had something called low time preference, where we were willing to forego gratification, right? In, in economic terminology, low time preference is to defeat Parkinson's law. It's to earn income and not spend all of it, right? It's the necessary first step. It occurred to me some years back, it's like, oh, I see why Parkinson's law has to come before all the other stuff about policies, because if you can't beat Parkinson's law, you're not going to pay premium, all right? You got to be saving. If you're not saving, then we're not having a conversation. So I like low time preference. This is going to have two implications for the design of a policy. Number one, and these are in order, number one is a substantial base policy. I'll get into what I mean by substantial. And then number two is if you're gonna use term to help accomplish what you've started, meaning a term writer, if you're gonna use a term writer to help accomplish what you've started with a substantial base policy, then in my opinion, depending upon the particular circumstance, we like what's called a long dated level term writer. Fixed amount of death benefit, fixed premium, fixed duration, a large duration. A lot of 20 and 30 year term writers come out of my office. Here's some more economic stuff. Okay, we talk about, uh, you know, the wealth is goods and services. Wealth is material stuff. Capital is financial value. It's what the stuff is worth. It's prospective. If you're a homeowner, you have an idea of what the house would sell for, you have an idea of how much debt you owe on the home, the difference between the two, that free and clear value is capital. Now you wanna get extra high resolution, take 80% of it, because the bank's not gonna lend you the full amount, right? It's the amount you can get to. The financial value of assets, the financial value of wealth, with acquisitive purpose, meaning you can get to it, right? We don't think of our primary vehicles as sources of capital because no one's taken their minivan or expedition or Lexus to the banker to collateralize it, to get a, a, a line of credit to go spend money, All right? So we don't, we don't count the, even though there is monetary value to a car, we don't count that as part of our capital because it's not, it doesn't have an acquisitive purpose. It's not, it's not there for us to go use to do something with. Okay, in contrast to cash value and whole life. 
We have explicit contractual access to it on purpose, where we can use it. Capital in dividend paying whole life insurance is called capital. To my mind, the infinite banking concept concept is a strategy for the strategic and optimal accumulation and deployment of capital. This is a capitalization strategy. It is not an investment strategy. So if Mass Mutual and other companies want to accuse people who are doing IBC of using investment terminology, that betrays to me a misunderstanding on their part of what this is. And I'm happy with that. I'm, I'm, the, look, I prefer everybody would all agree and everything would be fairy dust and unicorns. Okay. It's not. And so given the diversity of thought out there, I'm okay knowing that what we do is different. It's not, we don't do deposits. All that language in that memo, it's like, ee. If, if someone were to be subscribing to that kind of language, well, then, yeah, they're going to find themselves off in the wilderness. All right, capital's going to come up a lot today. Mentioned earlier, I have a specific design philosophy. Everybody online wants to start the conversation. Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers. What do the numbers say? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Put pause on that for a moment. Let's talk about values. Let's talk about what matters. Because if we don't know what we want to accomplish, if we don't know the goal in particular, we're going to end up off into the wilderness. Right? we got to set the goal first. To me, I want to acquire a policy where I can pay as much premium for as long as possible. Two as long as possible, I guess. <laughs> it's very long. Uh, while preserving a non-mex status. Now, look, I'm not saying you build a giant, I'm not saying you put somebody into a policy where the premium is two times their annual income. I'm also not saying you put it, put them into a policy where the premium is one time their annual income. All right. Uh, there's a whole conversation to be had that we can't get into it today about proper premium selection given the individual's particular financial circumstances. And their genuine willing, willing and abil- willingness and ability to pay premium. Okay, so I'm not saying you put somebody into a policy that's overbuilt. It's not what I'm saying. I'm also not saying you throw anything at the underwriter to see what sticks. Right? There is something to be said. We, we, I mean, if you want to be in this business, this is maybe for the new people here. If you want to be in this business and build a real reputation, you should be developing sound professional. Rela- when an application goes into your company of choice and they see your name, a smile should come across their face because all the things should, all the boxes should already be checked. Is the premium amount justified in terms of the income of the proposed owner? Is the death benefit justified in terms of human life value or net worth? What are those numbers? Do the math for me. Put it in a nice cover letter so I don't have to do it. An underwriter then also has to check numbers. Yep, lines up. Yep, lines up. Where's the paramed? And that's all we're waiting on. Done. Good relationships. By the way, it's okay to have really great relationships with underwriters so that when you need cases come along and you need an exception to a rule, they might give it to you. But there's... And I'll just... What I've learned from clients who used to be clients of other agents out there in the world is that these uh, plenty of agents just throw whatever, no cover letter, no justification, no explanation, or just go to the company and say, hey, here's a financial profile. What does this person qualify for? Oh my gosh. I mean, cancel the contract. I mean, what a, that, that, I empathize a lot with underwriters and home office people who have to deal with that. Because that, that is not proactive, in my opinion, that is not proactive professional business on our part. And we do ourselves and we do the reputation of IBC a disservice by submitting trash applications. More digressions, Jesus. Um, I view premium payment as establishing a premium payment capacity Flexibility in a PUA rider really matters to me. 
right? Uh, think of it from a banking perspective. If I'm going to put money in my bank, if I have a, if I'm a bank owner, I'm going to put capital in my bank. By God, I want to control when I do that. PUA rider flexibility in terms of the minimum charged on that PUA rider per year and in terms of whether or not it has to be paid modally matters to me, companies. And the more flexibility, the better. Uh, I tell, like I said, I tell clients, if you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. So I walk clients through this. Then I walk clients through what the various terms and conditions of the PUA riders at the various companies are. We stop talking about Mass Mutual and Northwestern and New York Life and Guardian real quick because their PUA riders are very restrictive. It's just a fact relative to what else is out there. That was a narrative, linguistic, philosophical discussion. Didn't have to look at one illustration to set those companies aside. Hmm. If I'm really implementing IBC, I want to pay a boatload of premium. I'm going to... You know, and I look, I do IBC. I want people who want to channel a substantial percentage of their annual cash flow appropriate to their circumstances into their own personal monetary system. Okay, if someone's going to do that, it's going to be a big number. And I don't mean big number in absolute terms. I mean big number as a percentage of their available financial resources. Big for them. It's going to be a serious number. Well, if I'm going to be putting a serious number into this policy, the set of policies, then I want the maximum flexibility when I do it. Because one element of the advisory process that is extremely neglected by this sign the app, take delivery, pay a premium so I can get paid quick mentality is what to do if things go wrong. What happens when, I don't know, yield curves invert for months and then there's a recession where somebody gets laid off and the source, of, the source of income that was serving as the premium for those policies is reduced by half or by 100% for 10 to 14 months, whatever it might be. What happens then? What's the contingency plan? How do I keep things up and running? What's that look like? Do, do, the, uh, do the features of the contract, the PUA writer in particular, does that afford me the flexibility in those trying times to keep the system up and running? Do I have a catch-up provision? Can I make up for PUA premium that I might have to miss in a given year? Do y'all have catch-up provisions in Canada? No? Fine. Um, flexibility matters. If you are in a situation where there is no flexibility, because look, I'll get people who have the more restrictive contracts, who hear what I have to say, and Nightmares start to conjure in their minds and they want a 1035 exchange. Let me get rid of it. And we say, whoa, 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 slow down. Just because the contract is restrictive doesn't mean it can't be valuable. It's still a dividend paying whole life policy. It still has a policy loan provision. You can still pay premium into it. Hopefully there's a substantial base policy. Hopefully there's no annually renewing term writer. I can't wait to get to that subject. Um, there, you can, you can still manage it. If you're with, if you have a, 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 let's say you've established a relationship with a company who has a relatively more, a relatively restrictive PUA rider, what's the, what's the solution from a contingency standpoint, from an exit strategy standpoint? A smaller premium. Make the number smaller, more manageable. More flexibility, you have the capacity to be more aggressive if the person wants to. All right. I tell people, first time client, this is generally speaking, it all varies case by case. You should feel really, really good about the base, the, the minimum PUA and the term rider premium. That's your infrastructure. It keeps the policy in force, helps preserve the preferable tax treatment, keeps the PUA rider on the contract. You need to feel great. Something goes wrong, you should still be able to pay it. Feel really great. The PUA rider component, depending upon the company and the flexibility, taking into consideration the minimums, taking into consideration whether it has to be paid at a scheduled modal interval or not, should feel like a surmountable challenge. Now, whether you want to lean more on the side of surmountable or whether you want to lean more on the side of challenge is up to you. This is an art, it's not a science. People who say that there is a right policy design for every person, a right premium for every person is wrong doesn't take into consideration that own individual's risk tolerance. 
or that individual's desire to be aggressive, however you want to look at it. It doesn't take into consideration the flexibility of the features of, of a given company. This is all material that I use in talking to a client to help them understand better what's going on. Through what's called the advisory phase in my process, I tell people the goal is to develop a higher and higher resolution understanding of how all this works. We combine that with your financial circumstances and at the end of it, the direction will be clear. I'm not gonna tell you what premium to pay. I'm not gonna tell you what structure to choose. I'm just gonna walk you through the trade-offs with all of those decisions. We'll talk it out and the right answer will be hanging out there at the end. By the way, and then we'll look at an illustration. A comment here on uh, the policy design terminology, this thing where we compare percentages, uh, you know, how much of a total annual premium outlay is allocated to one premium component versus another. It masks what I call PUA premium duration. A 1090, $100,000 total annual premium, 10 grand, who knows where the term writer premium is, by the way, that gets thrown in there somewhere. So we got the 10 grand in, in base, 90,000 in PUA. Okay, for how many years? Does the client even know that? If they, by the way, if they own a 1090, they don't know that. Uh, it's not as long as it could have been. All right, go back to the, the philosophy that I have there, as long as possible for as long as possible. <laughs> right? The fact of the matter is that in order to, uh, when using an annually renewing term rider, when you smash, when you smash the base down to nothing, in order to maintain the non-MEC status on that contract, PUA premium will be throttled down long before it otherwise would have had to have been. I did a, uh, it's called Whole Life Insurance Mechanics series. It's a seven and three quarter hour uh, free course lecture series on YouTube. In lecture six, I use an example of an actual client who brought these 1090 policies from a prior agent and I'm just like, hmm, I wonder how this could have been different. So I built the alternative. And the difference is millions of dollars in cash value late in life. And it's because in the more long-term oriented, more low time preference style build, where you have a substantial base policy and you have a long dated level term writer, the client has the ability to throw more fuel on the fire for longer, right? To pay more PUA for longer. PUA premium is a direct contribution to your own capital in a compounded growth environment. Why would you want to shut the ability to do that off any sooner than you otherwise have to? The only reason, in my view, is a misunderstanding of how the internal growth dynamics of these policies work. And the way we build them, the way I build these out, is that you've got the right, but not the obligation, to pay it. You can put a long-dated level term writer on a contract. Doesn't mean you have to keep it. Something comes along, devastating work injury, no income, certain that you're not going to generate any more income. Don't need the giant term I don't use giant term writers. Don't need the big term writer. You know you're not going to pay PUA premium. Drop the writers. Or don't. Or keep them. Or maybe you convert them. Ooh. Hmm, are annually renewing term writers convertible? Hmm, I don't know. I know for sure a long-dated level term writer is. I'm 30, came out of underwriting with a company that's here today uh, a few weeks ago. It's a 30-year term writer on the policy. When I'm 59 and 300 out of 360 days or whatever it is, I've, maybe I want to keep that. Well, however much it is in term death benefit, in term death benefit, and change it over into permanent death benefit. Maybe at the time of conversion, I transfer, I designed the new permanent whole life policy with an IBC style. Maybe by that point, I'm already uninsurable, but it doesn't matter because a term conversion goes through new business. A term conversion goes through policy services. It doesn't go through new business. Man, come on. Um, a lot of what's coming out of my mouth came out of James Nethery's first. Let's just acknowledge that, by the way. So if you, if you hear, if you hear things that you've heard him say before, it's, there's a reason for it.
Look, don't be afraid to capitalize. Be willing to pay a premium. Be willing to endure the early illiquidity. You know, if you got a client and they're afraid of that illiquidity of the base premium early on, then the premium number's too high. Easy. What about the numbers, man? This 1090 stuff. This is where, I mean, this is in-depth design here, but okay, so here's the claim online. Uh, I've mentioned PUA premium duration. I said that uh, if you got a 1090, 595, hey, keep going, right? 397. Uh, you know, I can pay that, I can pay that PUA forever and I can make the illustration dance. I can show at one particular company that's not here today, uh, a 1090 and I can show the, on a 30 year old, super ultra diamond studded preferred 90% of annual premium outlay payable for 30 years until 65 will RPU at the end of it. But hey, you get your 30 years of big old PUA payment. How's that done? The illustration proves that Ryan's wrong. No, it doesn't. How do they do it? Giant term riders. They're typically not long dated level. They're typically annually renewing. There are companies out there. Another great company selection discussion. Look, I don't use companies that force me to use annually renewing term if I want to pay PUA out of pocket. There's companies out there like that. We cross them off. What don't I like about annually renewing term? Well, it annually renews. Every year, the amount of death benefit is redetermined, typically based on what the non-guaranteed uncertain dividend payment was, right? The dividend that gets allocated, if it's allocated, goes to PUA premium. That PUA premium buys a bit of debt, buys some death benefit. There's a distance between that amount of new permanent additional death benefit and what's called the target death benefit. The difference between the initial death benefit the plus the new permanently paid up death benefit and the target death benefit is covered by the annually renewing term rider. So this term rider recalibrates every year to fill that gap. And if the dividends are lower than illustrated, the term rider has got to be bigger. If the dividends greater than illustrated, maybe the term rider is going to be smaller. Does that happen? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so every year this amount of temporary term death benefit can change. What changes with it? The premium amount. Oh, what happened between this year and last year? Someone got older. Mortality cost goes up. Annually renewing term riders look really great when you're 30, 40 years old. Come talk to me when you're 55 and 60. When that mortality curve starts to take a turn north. Yeah. Oh, and then let's imagine if the dividend is smaller in a year too so that the amount of death benefit we need on the annually renewed term rider has to be greater. Oh, and then let's, let's remember that cash value growth occurs in a compounded growth environment, so that one change early on means changes throughout the rest of the life cycle of the policy. A lower dividend in one year that buys less benefit and generates less cash value in one year means that we are on a permanently lower growth trajectory path. Okay, so let's have two or three, however many, more than one instances of a, of a dividend that I call it a deviating dividend, one that deviates from what's illustrated, which will happen. Let's let that happen once. Let's let all those cascading future cash values and death benefits now change. And then let's throw an annually renewing term writer in there to make up the difference as we go. Right, the annually annual renewing term reminds me of like these European sports cars. You know, they look real fly and flashy and, you know, they can, oh, they're so efficient. You know, they can go to zero to 100 in 0.8 seconds or whatever it is. You know, high cash value right away, year two, year three. Okay, they look really good right now. Everybody who buys a BMW knows that you buy new and that when the warranty ends, you get rid of it, right? Let one thing go wrong in the fuel system once. Throw a little pressure imbalance, a little deviating dividend, a little miscalibrated annually renewing term pricing. Let's do that once. And then it creates up a little pressure in another part of the fuel system. I gotta go back to the mechanic again. All right, gotta pay up that, you get a letter. I have letter, I have, I have a copy of this letter. Should have put it in here, sorry. I have a copy of this letter from a client, from one of the big four, you know. Uh, turns out the amount of annually renewing term premium that we told you you needed to pay is not gonna be enough. You need to pay us more. 
And if you don't, then the amount of death benefit's gonna come down. Hmm, why was the original amount of death benefit chosen? Hey, so now I'm gonna give up death benefit that was there on purpose to prevent a mech. So what's the result gonna be? I'm gonna lower my PUA premium. Hmm, where's that on the illustration? Oh, it's not there in the numbers? The numbers just told you the whole truth? Okay. <laughs> Y'all, this is my chance to vent, okay? I mean... <laughs> um, look, here's another problem. Put a big old term writer on there. It's a phenomenon called eating up insurability. Thank you, James. It's his terminology. Eating up insurability. We only have, every one of us, every, every individual person, look, I don't like maximum insurability standards. I don't like the idea of somebody telling me what I'm worth. Right? I get it. Death benefits indemnification for a loss meant to replace present value, future income that my beneficiaries otherwise would have enjoyed. I get it. Don't put a limit on that. My income this year is the basis for the income I'm going to earn for the rest of my life? No. But okay, you got to go buy something. Underwriters today in practice have to abide by state insurance commissions. I get it. Don't like it, but I get it. All right, so we are, we are all going to have a peak insurability, a peak human life value, a maximum insurability. At some point, the, the product of our annual gross income and what's called an income factor is going to maximize, okay? If I'm, 18, if I'm age 18 to 30, the income factor might be 30. This is, I don't know, established people know this, new people, this is for you. Uh, someone's 29 years old, earns 100 grand, 100 grand times 30, $3 million. Human, maximum human life value, $3 million. Every time I go to apply for a new policy, the underwriter wants to know what the proposed underwritten face amount is on the currently applied for policy. Okay, this is a death benefit that typically obtains somewhere around years three to five if the full PUA premium is paid for. Okay, so it's a near-term death benefit amount. That's the proposed underwritten face amount. My words, but I think it describes it. On a presently applied for policy, that number plus any other enforced coverage together needs to be less than three million. Needs to be under my human life value. Why do I go through all that? Mass mutual telling people that you're putting policies in force where there's not a justified insurability. What? The income factor is 30 at age 18 to 30. It's 25 for 31 to 40. I don't know if they're different in Canada, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, if there's an income above ground zero, there's insurability there. And every application, my opinion, in my office, not a single application goes to an underwriter unless the proposed underwritten death benefit is justified in terms of human life value or net worth, whichever is greater. It would make their lives easier. Hey, it would be okay for their lives to be, oh my gosh, this IBC business is so good. The applications are well justified. They stay in force. Why don't you put some of their producers on the little internal Council to help guide product design and the company in the future. Hmm. Maybe it's okay that we all, you know, the idea of mutual benefit doesn't hurt. Right? This is good business. Now the, now the, 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 the down and dirty sign the application, take delivery, pay a premium, let me get paid kind of business. People think that works. The agents who think that works, I think they're wrong. I don't think it's high quality business. I think the lapses are higher. Uh, there's no service, so there's not an ongoing client advisor relationship anyway, but if there were any service, those relationships are unpleasant. It's not good business. The long term, Nelson Nash style, bona fide IBC business is good business for the agent, for the consumer, and for the company, all at the same time. And if that's, if that's not the understanding, then someone doesn't understand. And it's either the agent, the client, the company, an outside industry group, or a combination of the four. Okay, so this, we put big old term riders. Look, I got, in order to prevent the mech status, I got to keep a sufficient amount of distance as determined by the software between my cash value and the total death benefit. 
okay, well, if I'm going to squeeze the base premium down to nothing, I'm going to squeeze the initial death benefit down to nothing. I'm going to blow up the PUA to build all this cash value right away. How am I going to maintain the difference between all that cash value and that little bitty death benefit? Well, I'll throw in a big old term rider. The result is eating up insurability. More death benefit in force than was necessary too soon. It's like an, it's like a, misallocation intertemporally of death benefit. I know, big word, I, but more death benefit too soon than was necessary. Not that a lot of death benefit isn't necessary. We want the right amount of death benefit. This is idea out there, I've heard this a million times. Base buys death benefit, PUA buys cash. Yikes. PUA premium only generates cash value because it buys death benefit. PUA premium is only payable because the base premium was paid first, and the payment of base premium does contribute to cash value growth. That's like wrong in three different ways, right? And oversimplifying doesn't help anybody. Help anybody. This is, Jason, this is a slide I mentioned to you earlier. This idea of just show me the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Just send the number. If I have a client... Who, Client who asked me that, we're not a good fit. The numbers don't speak for themselves. Yeah? Because what will happen is there's an implicit assumption. I need cash value to exceed my cost basis as soon as possible. By the way, I've already beat up three other agents. I have illustrations from them. I know when the cash value beats their cost basis, and I'm just comparing to yours. And I might be saying all the right things to get to the point to get you to send me an illustration. So if I can sense that you're willing to do that, I'm going to wear you out and then ghost you. And that happens. And it's like, mm, proper classification. Nelson Nash, dendrology, proper classification of trees, proper classification of clients. So I, you know, I, I'm sensitive to this because, again, it's not in their best interest. If you're going to focus on the near term, look, you want to focus on the near term, go get universal life. Stop messing with whole life. Go put it in the market. What do you do? Guarantees? <laughs> One number just has to be higher than the other, right? The numbers don't lie. Go do the... IBC is not for you if that's all you want. IBC is a philosophy. It starts with the quality of the ideas, the goals, the value set, right? Not the numbers on the page. We say illustrations are non-guaranteed. It's like, oh, that's a funny little quip. It's like, mm, no, it's a, it matters. The number of people I have, I, for, all my clients, I do complimentary enforce policy review. Searching for figs. Is there something wrong? I don't want my people who have policies from other people, I don't want anything bad to happen with them. Even though I didn't put them in force, I don't care. We just look them over, tell them what they have. Nine out of ten times, we miss something. Late life mech triggers. Mm. Late life mech triggers. Policy looked good up front. There's this little superscript on age 80, page four, you know, the tabular detail. Oh, this policy becomes a modified endowment contract at the current dividend scale. Hmm. When's that going to happen? 35 years from now. Okay, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> right? That'll be a fun letter to get. Yeah, no. So how do, so, and then you guide the client through the, look, uh, peop, my clients have these contracts with other companies with which I'm not appointed. I'm not the agent of record. I can't do anything. But I can tell them what to say. I can give them the words. I can advise them indirectly. Go tell them you want an enforced illustration that shows no mech triggers for the life of the contract and adjust the premium accordingly. Yeah, so this, you know, this technocratic, it's a very part of this postmodern age. Just show me the data. Keep your values out of it. Okay. <clears throat> kind of touched on this already. I refer to this idea of mech fragility. Um, look, dividends. This is a, this came to me on a, a Banking with Life podcast. We're sitting there right at the table and I'm, it, the light bulb went off. Let me say this, I'll say it again. 
dividends have a decreasing effect on death benefit growth, but a constant effect on cash value. Dividends have a, specifically PUA from dividends, has a diminishing effect on death benefit and a constant effect on cash value. If I pay a $5,000 PUA premium at age 60, maybe it buys $7,000 in death benefit. If I had paid that same $5,000 in PUA at age 30, maybe it buys $15,000 in death benefit. Right, when I'm 60, obviously I'm older, mortality cost is higher, the same premium dollars buys less death benefit. But what's the death benefit worth at age 60? The, what's the 7,000 in new death benefit worth at age 60? And what's the death benefit of 15,000 worth at age 30? The same. It's the same. They're both future cash flows. One, that future cash flow is closer. The other one, that future cash flow is further away. So the, the change in death benefit diminished plus 15,000 at age 30 versus plus 7,000 in this example at age 60. Decreasing effect on death benefit, constant effect on cash value. What happens to dividends in a dividend paying whole, on a well-funded dividend paying whole life policy as time goes on? You get bigger and bigger. This effect magnifies the further out you go. Dividend paying whole life policies from a MEC perspective become more dividend dependent the older the contract. And because dividends have this diminishing effect on death, and of course, look, cash value is the net present value of the death benefit. They're going to equal each other at 121. The cash value has got to catch up to the death benefit at age 121. Right? But we've got to maintain that appropriate distance between cash value and death benefit in order to preserve the non-MAC tax status. Okay? But if I've got a contract where I squish the, the guaranteed base policy death benefit down to nothing, I'm patch, I'm doing piecemeal patchwork with annually renewing term and I'm shoveling it a bunch of PUA, I'm compressing that distance between cash value and death benefit. I'm sneaking up to the mech line, right? Because everybody wants to go poke the IRS bear, right? Give me a mech line that's a dollar and eight cents above the maximum contractual premium. Why? Put a little more term on there. Who cares? You know? Every, I learned this fun fact. Every company has gone to MEC remediation with the IRS. IRS can decide. Oh, that policy wasn't a MEC originally. Well, now it is. Yeah, who's going to be at the front of that line? The people with substantial base policies, healthy term writers, and appropriate death benefit? Or the one with mangled policies with an annually renewing term and a little bitty initial death benefit with a small base policy? Who's going to be at the front of that line? Not me, not my people. Then there's other consequences that come with it. Look, you can get all your money back out in year two or year three, so let's jack that premium up. You have equity in your home? Go get a HELOC. Let's use that money too. Right? How these, how's these, how these applications get passed underwriters, I don't know. I think that the software of some of the companies allows people, allows the agent to submit with just showing the base premium. Maybe they ignore the PUA, I don't know. But excessively high premiums I have found often comes with these 1090, 595, 397 kind of policies. And then of course maximum loan activity, which the companies themselves know they don't like, because historically a lot of loan activity means the policy owners in poor financial straits. They're looking for money. Maybe they're going to have to start selling assets. Maybe that premium doesn't become so important anymore. Right? You can understand the logic. Now, of course, I would encourage companies to then look at loan repayment activity too. Right? Now just look at it halfway. Yes, there's more loan activity on IBC-style business, but if it's good IBC-style business, and you might even could tell whether particular business is good IBC business or not by looking at this is whether the people pay the loans back. Have a plan for loan repayment. Don't steal the peas. Pay your, you know, you, look, 1090, you can get all this cash in. You can turn right around and get a policy loan. You don't make your money in the policy. You make your money with your loans, right? Heard that one almost verbatim from a popular YouTube person. Okay. Then what happens when things go wrong? Then what happens when a recession happens? When you get laid off, when the customers stop buying, when there's a cash flow interruption of some degree of severity, in other words, 
All those non-forfeiture options to some degree depend on uncollateralized value in that contract. You want to surrender some previously purchased additional death benefit to pay the premium? Got to have uncollateralized cash value. Want to take a policy loan to pay the premium in a year where you can't pay it out of pocket? Got to have uncollateralized cash value. Cash value. But if I, you know, if I was talked into this big old giant premium, because I can go get all my money right back out right away to go do my Airbnb Rockefeller style investing, you know, because I'm going to get my mailbox money cash flow style on TikTok, um, then something unexpected happens. I'm I'm in a, I'm in I'm in a bad place. All right, policy will lapse. It's okay. It's out of the clawback period though. Ooh, ooh. Uh, very typical of those kinds of conver uh, advisory relationships, if we can even call it that, is no support. I am shocked by the number of people I have who have prior policies, substantial base premium, not manipulated policy designs, not bad. Um, I called my agent. I want to pay 50 grand more in premium. They won't answer the phone. What? What? Uh, you know, can't oh, just call policy services. Mm. I uh, had my truck, when I had a truck, parked at uh, Dallas Love Field Airport, came home one day, and the tailgate was missing. Someone stole the tailgate off the truck. <laughs> so I, I called my agent. So I, <laughs> and this is true. I call my agent. Oh, I'm out of the business. You have to just call the carrier. Ooh, made me madder than losing the tailgate. You know, expect someone to be there, call for service. By the way, clients don't know to ask about whether or not service is provided after the sale. It's okay to voluntarily bring that up with them ahead of time. Hey, just so you know, so we can be on the same page and have the proper expectations. Once this, once you get this policy from me or policies, in my mind, that creates an advisor client relationship. You need service managing this contract in the future. You can call the policy services department or life insurance company if you want. Get frontline customer service staff. They're trying their best. I get it. They don't know you like I do. So you're welcome to call us. Call them if you want. We'll get you taken care of. Low time preference policy design consists of a substantial base policy. The younger you are, the more that should, the younger the insured is, the more as a percentage of the annual premium outlay should go to the base, my opinion. I typically don't go, I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, right? I typically don't go lower than 30, 70. And when I say structures, the first number refers to a percentage of annual outlay payable to base and term. Second number refers to the percentage of annual outlay payable to PUA. Whenever I talk about premium structure, I also talk about, have to talk about term writers, that's going to help them understand how long that PUA component is payable for. All right, just throwing structures at people is not helpful without a discussion of duration. That doesn't mean 3070 is always and everywhere the right structure. I tell people, look, the more you have to the base premium, to the base policy, the more mech resilient and the higher long-term cash values and death benefits will be. The right policy design in terms of premium structure is a question of values. You want to emphasize the short term now? You want to be relatively high time preference? You want to emphasize the long term? Nelson Nash said to think long range and don't be afraid to capitalize. I know what I like. What do you want? I'll write this selection. I won't go lower than this, but otherwise it's up to you. That's how I don't tell people what structure to choose. And it's a very interesting array of response. And by the way, it's a, there's no magic to any of this stuff. Right? The companies don't even talk about these policies in terms of this language. Only IBC people do, because we're talking about premium. They're all thinking about death benefit. You'd be surprised at the range of voluntary suggested responses I get. You know what? I don't like term. I don't like the idea of renting death benefit. I don't want a big old decrease in death benefit when my term writer expires. I like the idea. You know, I'm thinking long range. I want to do what Nelson taught. Give me 50-50. Okay. I'm buying a house. Um, I'm going to need to take a loan. I know I got to repay the loan. Got a substantial down payment. I got four kids. <laughs> I got 12 kids. I got 12 kids. I'm like, okay, well, your need for capital is probably a little more urgent right now. The greater the intensity of your need for capital, the more that should go to the PUA within limits. 
Don't squish the base premium down to nothing just because the illustration software will let you do it. Or do that, give them four years, they'll become my client. <laughs> uh, comment on term riders. Um, I distinguish between short and long term, short and long dated term riders. A short dated rider would be like a seven to 10 year. A long dated rider would be like a 20 to 30 year. Of course, this dep depends upon the age of the insured, right? If you got someone who's 65, not gonna give them a 30 year term rider, I get it, right? But given the insured's age, my view, the longer the better. Confirming with the company that the term is convertible wouldn't hurt either. Don't even really have to bring that up with the client. Right? I mean, maybe you do, maybe it comes up naturally, right? But it's something to talk about in the future too, right? Hitting that time, you know, these term riders are gonna fall off. Let's convert if you want. The response to this is, well, let me put a short dated term writer on it because this is about a system of policies. Nelson said this is about a system of policies, right? If one banking branch is successful, let me go start the second one. I get it. Did I put the, no, I didn't. Um, what that does not mean though, is you inhibit the potential growth of the first branch in order to start a second branch sooner than necessary, right? You don't handicap the first branch so that you can get started laying the foundation on the second one sooner, okay? So we wouldn't, in my view, we wouldn't put a long dated, you know, let's say a, if someone's 30, there's a 30 year term writer going on there. If the client doesn't like term, hey, you don't like term, fine. What's the consequences of not having term? PUA duration goes down, not gonna be able to pay PUA for as long. Um, and then of course, with the higher base, lower PUA comes relatively greater illiquidity earlier on. If you're good with that, which is fine, things still look great, then we're good. We don't, forget about the renting term thing. MEC, uh, MEC resilience goes up, right? No decrease in death benefit when the term rider expires. Um, a system of policies does not justify short dated or short pay funding strategies, in my opinion. Here's an example. I took, gee whiz, 18 minutes, okay. Um, one policy with a 30 year term, it's built 4060. There's a $50,000 annual premium. We are PU at age 60 just so I can keep cash flows even between the two examples. I'm not saying you should do this. This is just for example purposes. That's scenario A. Scenario B is a set of three policies. One started every 10 years. Each policy has a 10 year term rider. It's RPU'd after the expiration of the term. Same policy premium, same structure. One policy age 30 to 39, then RPU it. Then another, RPU it. Then another, RPU it. This is a you know short, dated, short, funded style. The problem with this, major problem in th with this in my opinion, this reintroduces underwriting risk. I gotta go back through underwriting every 10 years, who knows what's gonna happen between now and then, both medically and financially. All right, I gotta clear both those hurdles each time. Also turns out that cash values and death benefits in the single older policy are a bit higher. And of course they are, right? There's fewer recurring startup costs. Blue is scenario A, cash value increases on an annual basis. Red is scenario B, the system of policies. You can see what's going on here. Same total cash value. Blue is marginally higher. I don't know where it came from, this idea that once you hit year five or year seven or year X, whatever it is, the policy is more, that's when the policy is most efficient, so go start another one. That logic doesn't work. And it reintroduces, the more important part is it reintroduces underwriting risk. And death benefits are greater. If you want to object to those graphs, you can, but we're gonna, we got limited time here. Um, <laughs> hey man, meet the client where they're at does not mean abdicate advisory responsibility. Uh, I'm not a yes man, I'm not an order taker. You come to me and say, oh, I want this, I found this online, can I have this? Maybe, um, you know, tell me why, let's walk through the rationale. And out, it's out of that proper, slow, 
advisory conversation, the optimal premium will come. Right? It comes naturally. It's organic. If you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. My view, if you're finding yourself falling over yourself or depending upon third-party software that you got to pay a subscription fee for every month in order to find the money to pay a premium, maybe you should return to first principles. And that number should be more organic. Maybe. This is part two of three. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good, David. We're gonna. It's gonna go. It's gonna go smooth. Another thing that came up during the podcast once was this idea of the eager investor syndrome. I think it's a extension of Parkinson's law, right? So we've we've moved from policy design. Now we've got the policy. Now we're managing it. Now we're using it. Okay. Um, we're brought up in a state of severe indoctrination where we're told to be used to not having access to money. Severe undercapitalization. We're not used to it. Someone comes along, tells us how to do it. Suddenly we build up a bunch of cash value. That's unfamiliar, chaotic territory. What do I do? I gotta be doing something. I've been in fight or flight mode because I've been systematically, severely undercapitalized my whole life. And my, so was my mother and father and their parents and their parents and their parents. What do I do with all this money? Money, capital. What do I do with all this capital that I've now accumulated? I want to maximize the efficiency in my system. The, when I flip through illustrations and part four equipment financing and see more and more loans, more loan activity is associated with more cash value activity. Maybe I'm not entrepreneurial enough to be doing IBC. See how all this flows, right? Yeah. No. Loans do not cause cash value to rise. More loan activity is just more loan activity. Eager investor syndrome is this propensity to increase policy loan indebtedness just because the cash value is available, similar to how Parkinson's law is the tendency for expenses to rise as income goes up. That's why I view them as connected. Uh, you don't have to, you know, you don't, Nelson didn't, Nelson's characters in becoming your own banker didn't take loans for four years. And even when they did, it was for boring stuff, the stuff they were going to do anyway. You don't have to do anything new. You don't have to go be a little Rockefeller acolyte because TikTok told you to. <laughs> what do I use policy loans for? I don't know. By the way, the presumption of arrogance that I know what you should do with your capital, how, how would I know that? Now I can talk you through, and by the way, the presumption that you would know what I should do with my capital, or, or that the, the online investment marketer knows what the best, the highest and best use for my capital is. You can't say that with a straight face. Maybe that isn't the opportunity. Maybe the one who's being marketed to is. You know, if you're looking online, maybe you should look in the mirror before you look online for investment and entrepreneurial opportunity. Good, I'm on the right track. <laughs> IBC is not a financial hack. It's people are dying for counterculture financial education. No one likes. No one really like. No one who's serious. Let me let me specify. No one who's serious likes the gamified, spammy, clickbaity nonsense on social media. And the advertising firms that are knocking at your door and blowing up your LinkedIn inbox and your email inbox, telling you how you can spend all sorts of tens of thousands of dollars so that they can gamify and get you into the 21st century are taking advantage of a feeling of inadequacy that you don't need to have. Because all the tech stuff is just... The icing, it's just the face, it's just the facade. What people want is the substance. And if you just give them the substance, they'll be like, oh my God, I mean, it's, I, I've never heard all this before. Yeah, I know, because everybody who's online is distracted. And the noise, it is the noise, that's what the noise is. That's the contemporary manifestation of it. It's not necessary, you don't have to do it. You don't have to feel pressured into it. You don't have to feel pressured into the high-tech sales systems. You don't have to go do a podcast. You don't have to go do video. You don't have to do the things that I do or that James does. 
When I talk to people, I get, I've had people who are mentored by other agents who call me, who, who I spend more time with than do their mentors. And we're talking, and an hour into the conversation, he tells me, uh, yeah, I used to be a, I, I've had a heating and air, uh, and air conditioning business for 20 years. I'm like, oh, who's the guy on YouTube making videos about how to use IBC in a heating and air cooling business? Oh, is it nobody? Hmm. Why not be that person? Who's talking about IBC for cosmetics people? Who's talking about IBC for you name it? Who can speak that language in that industry? Other than someone who's got that experience. Go do that. You don't have to be the economist. You don't have to be, you can do you. I said in a previous talk here that you're going to do you better than anybody else can do you. So the principles of specialization and division of labor suggest that you should go do that. And God will reward you as you serve your people. Real quick here, positive EVA is not enough. Oh, the advertised rate of return is 10%. My policy loan rate is 5%. 10 minus 5 is plus 5. Financial analysis means observing the difference between a big number and a small number. Therefore, I should do this. No. Positive EVA isn't enough. The decision set's always incomplete. We don't know the value of the next best opportunity. Right? It's not the, the, the comparison that matters is not between the advertised rate of return and we can assume it's legitimate and the cost of capital or the policy loan rate. It's half the picture. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Maybe you go do that. Go take it. You know, you got 50 grand in cash value. Opportunity comes up with positive EVA. Okay. You take advantage, you know, $30,000 required to get into an investment generating a 5% net rate of return accounting for inflation. Great. Was that a good decision? I don't know, maybe a month goes by. Another opportunity comes around. Bonafide net positive rate of return accounting for inflation of 25%, but it takes 40 grand. Oh, you don't have the money? Hmm. The right comparison was not between the EVA at month zero and the policy loan rate at that time and the cost of capital. The right comparison was between the... The, the bona fide net rate of return at month zero and the bona fide net rate of return at month one. But Ryan, month one hasn't happened yet. I know. The future's uncertain. You have to know. You have to judge. You have to discern what counts as an opportunity for you. What's a high, what's a high enough number for you to get out of bed and be serious? And I think if you are serious in a lot of those opportunities, go right into the spam folder. Uh, by the way, the best opportunities in the world consist of hyper-local knowledge that nobody else knows about or understands, that only you do. We're a, a, in a domain where you're hyper-specialized, where you know something other people don't, and where the timing is right. Man, this timing thing. Uh, yeah, positive EVA could, could mean missing uh, even more. This is from Nelson's book. It's from, becoming your, from Building Your Warehouse of Wealth. The opportunity came to him. Right? He knew something about the uh, the the, eight, the hundred acres in Alabama. He knew something about it. He had specialized knowledge about it. Right? What is that for you? Any foresters in here? Then, oh, one. Okay. He's got certain opportunities we don't have. Okay. Uh, so he knew it was a good deal. Made two more investments. None of that's on the illustration. The business cycle factors in here because in, in relation to this a question of opportunity discernment. What is the business cycle? It's called the boom and bust cycle. Technical stuff is up there. It's where the pace of new money production, the counterfeit criminal cartel we call the Federal Reserve System and the commercial banks, create a bunch of what Nelson used to call fake money or funny money. That goes disproportionately to certain industries, bids up asset prices and the valuation of companies and therefore the stocks along with them. All right, so tech firm valuations shoot for the roof and all this. Then at some point something happens, the powers that be in all their wisdom decide to stop doing that so much. Maybe they reduce the flow of new criminal counterfeiting. 
right? So do a little less of it. Or maybe they actually absolutely disinflate. They reduce the amount of money, which I think is happening now, uh, a tightening of the money supply, overall money, monetary supply contraction. Well, it turns out the criminals got used to the free money, and so they built businesses, quote unquote businesses around it, right? And then the, the trough gets taken away, so now they're starving. Okay, well, bidding subsides for those factors of production and those companies, valuations fall. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all laying people off. Oh, all technology firms, all at the top of the structure of production, all in very capital intensive industries. Right? When the money supply starts to contract absolutely, or even when there's disinflation, interest rates start to rise. We get what's called a yield curve inversion. It's happening right now. A perfect prediction record of recession within 12 to 18 months, going back since World War II. Just saying. Um, a, a depression or a recession is a really bad time for people who don't have capital. It is a fire sale for people who do. Oh, but I could, you know, I, I could get all my money out of my policy right away. So I did my 1090 with my annual renewing term. I took a maximum policy loan. I'm fully loaned out. Recession hits. Asset prices plummet. I don't have uncollateralized cash value to go get the things I could have got otherwise. Had I not, had I been patient and waited for an opportunity to come to me. But no, I was talked into an opportunity by some marketer who wanted to show me how to master my cash flow so that I could pay a premium and get him paid a commission. People have gone through, there are people who are watching this online. You have clients who have gone through this ringer. 1971, gray bars are recessions. There's 1970. Oh, look at that. Turns out that need for capital that Nelson's friend had occurred during a recessionary period. Hmm, wonder if that's coincidental. Uh, part of what goes with this you know, just get all your money out is, you know, run your expenses through. Just run your expenses through. Run a loan balance. That, to me, is stealing the peas. You have no plan for repayment. And, and, and to just say, oh, I'm going to have a future windfall, it's a place to put money. I mean, yes, that's, again, that's in Nelson's book, having a place to put money. It, it's also not the case, it's also not the case that that was Nelson's first policy. It was not the case that that's where he started. It was only after he had learned and been teaching and practicing these principles that he got more aggressive in that fashion and created a place to put money, right? So to say we're going to play a find the money approach and build that into the advisory process so we can jack up the premium to get paid more might not be a good idea. Not saying that people, there are, that is happening because I've seen the illustrations on enforced policies. Well, they told me to just run the loan balance. I can control the loan. I'm the banker. I can do what I want. Half true. All great deceptions are half true. And there's enough of Nelson in that to make it sound like, oh, yeah, yeah. without proper guidance. Understanding something about the economics in this situation puts you in a superior position. Not that you want to get into an argument about it. I don't recommend that, but... Conventional finance doesn't have an answer for the business cycle. They call it sequence of returns risk. It means they don't have an answer for the business cycle. Uh, recessions and depressions are a feature, not a bug, a feature of fractional reserve banking. Uh, so they're going to happen. When they happen, I don't know. You don't know. The conventional financial planner surely doesn't know. Uh, and the CNBC people don't know either. You don't know if it's going to happen right now. And oh, by the way, just keep your money in the market for longer. You'll run it out. Yeah, you'll run it out right into the next recession. So that like, people think that's like a funny quip, like, oh, it's not your, it's not time in the, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. Yeah, you're going through what a lot of people are going through right now, age 60 and 70, looking at a tax qualified plan that took a kick in the teeth, wondering how they're going to pay to live the rest of their life. And that's a feature of conventional planning. IBC solves for that. Cash value and dividend paying whole life's non-market correlated. I don't care what happened in the market. Oh, and I'm solving for the banking function. Jeez. <laughs> Dude, this is perfect timing. I'm pretty proud of myself. Um, high versus low time preference. 
Do low time preference policy design. Don't be afraid to capitalize. It's okay to have illiquidity. Endure that early illiquidity. It's good for you. A system of policies in Nelson's book doesn't mean that we can go with short dated. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I don't care. But it, it doesn't lend credence to a short pay or a short dated term design necessarily. I wish I could get more into this capital attracts opportunity, man. When you've got more capital, it transforms your perspective. It transforms how you see the economic landscape. There is no such thing as an opportunity. You can't go to the store and get an opportunity off the shelf. All there is are opportune circumstances. Circumstances that appear opportune, meaning that if you engaged in those circumstances, you could create a superior outcome. We call that whole set of stuff an opportunity. But what makes that opportunity an opportunity is, in part, your ability to engage with the circumstances. Well, what's going to regulate your ability to engage with the circumstances? Could part of it be how much capital you have? Okay, it follows, therefore, that the amount of capital you have affects the landscape of opportunity. There are things that people can see that you don't see or that the client doesn't see because they're not walking around with enough capital. And so it could be that the right investment strategy actually starts with the right capitalization strategy. And what would the right capitalization strategy be? Thank you. <laughs>